All righty. So if you're ready, um, I'm ready. Yeah, we're good to go. Let's, uh, yeah, take it away. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me, especially thank uh, Rebecca and WSU for setting this all up. A uh, little different. I've done lots of classes, but never online uh, like this. So uh, again, I appreciate it. So what I'll start with is talk a little bit about steel. Uh, we are a family owned business, have been for almost 100 years. Uh, we celebrate our 100th on 2026. But really, uh, we're an engineering company focused on engineering and focused on uh, making a safe product that gets the work done that you need to out in the field. Of course, uh, one of our main priorities is we have servicing dealers, uh, people that you can go to in your local communities to get your questions answered about products, how to use them, what is the right product for you, as well as the service side of, of things. And you can kind of see a timeline there as we expanded from a uh, 1926 to mid 70s. We were only built in Germany. We expanded to the United States, Brazil, and Switzerland. 2004, uh, did an R&D facility. Uh, 2005, we started a factory in China, mainly for the Southeast Asian market as well as uh, South America, some of those areas. But it is a steel factory in every sense of the way, except we happen to be in, in China. And then 2007, we just uh, we brought the bar manufacturing to the United States. And as we sit here today, uh, there's about a $250 million investment in a, another bar plant uh, right next to it, so we can supply all of your needs. Uh, kind of to show you where we're built and manufactured, our headquarters uh, are in Germany. Uh, we have plants in Switzerland, Austria, United States, uh, Brazil, and China. But the United States is not only the largest uh, factory in the world, uh, producing well over 4 million products a year, uh, also the highest quality factory in the world. So we definitely like teasing the Germans that, well, you guys are great engineers, but we can build stuff better in, in the United States. And we've proven that over and over again. And then again, uh, just about 80% of what you'd buy in the United States is built in the United States in our factory in, in Virginia Beach. And we chose that location, a uh, great port, but more importantly, there's a lot of military, which means we have access to uh, military spouses, uh, retired military. They make the best workers in the world, so that's where we want to be. So going on, uh, what we want to talk about today is why accidents happen, safety features, uh, reactive forces. Uh, by that, I mean kickback, the safety apparel that you should use uh, whenever you start a chainsaw, uh, thinking safety, and then final uh, proper maintenance. Uh, because again, uh, the saw, the safety of using that product, saw, trimmer, whatever it is, is really based on the maintenance. If it's not running properly, you start fighting it, and that's where injuries can happen. So let's start with why do accidents happen? It may seem funny, but really the more experience you have, uh, the more likely people are to take shortcuts, to ignore those safety uh, recommendations that they've learned over the years, and really it comes down to overconfidence. And I tell a story on myself. I started with the US Forest Service back in uh, 1978, worked them for them for about eight years. And I'd never had a close call with a chainsaw until I was cutting firewood at home. And at that point, I felt that I could pretty much handle any situation that came up. Um, the chain break failed, never had a kickback. So I removed it because I couldn't get parts for it. Um, had my thumb over the top of the handlebar instead of gripping it like you should, uh, like a bicycle uh, handlebar with your thumb wrapped underneath. And I had a kickback, it kicked that saw up, my hand slipped off the handlebar into the chain. Uh, but luckily, uh, all it did was hit my wedding ring, gave me a nice scratch, but didn't cut me. But boy, was it an eye opener. It really proved I was not God's gift to uh, chainsaw operators. So really every year that I'm around this equipment, the more I slow down, pay attention, um, there's no reason to get into a hurry. When you talk about fatigue, um, a lot of the fatigue you feel at the end of the day is the noise and vibration of that product. So uh, we've worked diligently to come up with the engineering factors that reduce that. Uh, you may have noticed that the mufflers are as far away from your body as we can get them, uh, specifically in chainsaws or out at the front of it. And then we're going from uh, rubber vibration mounts to spring mounts. And even our chain has some uh, 
design features in it that, that reduce that, that uh, vibration. And we found about 80% of the, the vibration that you feel at the end of the day is a direct result of noise and vibration. And then hopefully you're really concentrating uh, when you're using a product. And that's also stressful, tiring. Uh, I kind of equate it to driving on an old country road where there's no traffic versus uh, a busy city, city with lots of traffic. It's very fatiguing. So you want to pay attention to that. Um, as I always say, you know, if you read your operator's manual, it says to wait uh, 10 minutes from the time that product runs out of fuel until you refuel it. Part of that, of course, is to let that product cool down in case you happen to, to spill fuel on that hot engine. Uh, it's less likely to ignite. But that's 10 minutes you can take a break. Uh, other thing that I uh, will all tell, always tell you is when I'm going fast, I have extra chains. So when I dull a chain, I can throw a fresh chain on and go back to work. If I'm tired though, that's about the only time you'll see me hand file uh, the chain because it takes 15 to 20 minutes. That's a good time to, to uh, catch my breath again. So again, if you're getting tired, you're not picking up your feet, you're tripping, boy, maybe it's time to take a break, maybe start again in the, in the morning. Uh, not wearing the proper uh, safety apparel. As I'll show you here in a minute, there's some specific things that we ask that you wear whenever you do operate a chainsaw. And uh, But don't get, again, complacent with that. Uh, if you, there's a windstorm, there's a large branch that you can't move by hand. Oh, I could take two minutes to cut that out with my chainsaw. Take the extra five minutes to put the, the safety apparel on. Uh, I always equate it to uh, the day your uh, car insurance expires is probably the day you're going to get in, the, in a wreck. So the same thing is true with, with safety apparel. When you go to a, a local dealer, they're going to basically ask you two questions at first. Uh, how large is the wood that you're typically cutting and how much of it you're going to cut? And we really try to, to size the product for the job you're, you're doing. Um, a heavier, larger saw. Um, Again, it's heavier, uh, it has more noise, more vibration. Typically the bar is longer, so it's easier to hit something with the bar. So really what, what I have always uh, pushed is absolutely the lightest, smallest chainsaw that will do the job I need to do. And for example, uh, the most common chainsaw we sell has a 20 inch bar. And with skill and practice and a couple of plastic wedges, um, I can cut a 40 inch tree with that. Uh, so you can double the bar length is, is what you're able to cut with a saw. But think about it, uh, why would I have a 40 inch bar if I see a tree that size every few years? I'm gonna carry the lightest uh, product that I can. And then finally, as I talked about earlier, uh, equipment maintenance. Uh, it, those of you that have been around uh, have used equipment out in the woods, you know, you're tripping, you're falling, there's brush. Uh, things are slapping you. And if you're fighting with the equipment as well, your chances of, of getting an injury uh, really accelerate. Uh, so if it isn't working right, stop, figure out what's going on, uh, and we'll go through some maintenance practices here in a bit. Uh, most importantly, if, it, if you can't get it running properly, don't continue to use it uh, because it's just going to cost a lot more. And, and while as a technician for over 40 years, I appreciate that. Uh, that's how I've made my living. We really want you to have the best uh, experience with this product, and it really is all about maintenance. Uh, the more maintenance you do, the longer it'll last. Uh, quick aside there, I worked uh, just south of Mount St. Helens when it erupted. Uh, we were sending out about 30 saws a day uh, to the thinners and other forestry workers, and because they were maintained every single evening when they came off, off the field, uh, we never had any failures until Mount St. Helens uh, erupted. And then of course we didn't have the air filters. Nobody experienced that kind of dust before. And uh, the whole fleet of chainsaws were done in uh, probably three days. So it really proved the importance of a good air filter. Uh, all the chainsaw manufacturers learned a lot from Mount St. Helens. Next we'll talk a little about safety features. Uh, some of these were designed uh, by steel. Others were designed by steel after uh, government regulations came in place. But one thing I can tell you is, uh, as I said earlier, Steel is an engineering company and just about any modern feature you'd find on a chainsaw was probably uh, designed by one of our engineers. 
So chain brakes, uh, ignition modules, electronic ignition, automatic oilers, uh, centripetal clutches. Uh, believe it or not, some of the earliest chainsaws had a transmission. Uh, you'd put them in neutral uh, to start them and then put them in whatever gear uh, you needed to cut. So getting the weight down uh, has always been a, a factor for steel. So we'll talk here, uh, this is called the throttle lock. Uh, that prevents you from squeezing the trigger and accelerating the engine unless your hand is the right position to, to depress this latch. And we have the same uh, feature on all of our products, whether it's a, a handheld blower, a backpack blower, a chainsaw. And so this prevents, uh, you lay this, the chainsaw trimmer on the ground, a stick happens to hit that trigger. Um, it can't accidentally accelerate unless that uh, latch is also depressed. So one of the things you wanna do before you ever start it is uh, literally just grab the trigger. Can I accelerate the saw with my hand off the handle? That mechanism is broken and needs to be serviced. Uh, we have what we call a, a master control. You can see there, I'll, I'll go through them as it, as it finishes. Uh, clear down is the choke position. So imagine uh, this piece of equipment has been sitting in your garage, back of your truck for a few days. The fuel will have evaporated out of the fuel system, fuel lines, carburetors. So we put it in that choke position to give it as much fuel as possible uh, during that initial start when the, the fuel system is, is empty. One word of caution, uh, because of noise regulations and uh, vibration mounts, you may not hear that fault start. Uh, we call it a burp. You'll hear the engine try to start momentarily, but because there's too much fuel, um, it, it can't start and run at that point. Well, it's very common for people to pull the rope. They don't hear that uh, fault start. They continue pulling it. And now there's so much gas in the engine that it, it can't start. So rule of thumb is put it in the choke position, pull it as hard as you can, uh, two, three, maybe four at the most. And even if you don't hit that uh, start position, go ahead and move it into the next position, which is the half throttle uh, position. Uh, chain brake is engaged, you'd start it. It's gonna run at a very high RPM when it starts you immediately touch the trigger. That drops it to the I position. You can see in the picture there. And that's where you would leave it for uh, normal operation as you're walking from tree to tree, whatever it is. And then of course, when you wanna accelerate it. But of course, the, the main safety feature here is the O position. And that is, I don't really have to look for it. All I have to do is flip my thumb upwards. It shuts off the unit and, and we're good. So uh, the main concern there is don't pull it too many times with the choke on. Uh, let's say you've been using the product, you set it down for uh, three, five, 10 minutes, you're moving some wood around. What I would immediately do is uh, you have to squeeze the trigger completely, go down to the choke, go one click up so it has more fuel. Uh, it should start in that position. If it doesn't, or it starts for a millisecond or two and then dies, that means the fuel has evaporated. Go back to the choke, maybe two pulls, half throttle, and I can almost guarantee it will start as long as it's mechanically able to. Now you're looking at the exhaust system, and this is probably the most regulated component, component that we do have on the chainsaws and trimmers. And the first regulation was back uh, 50s or 60s, where the US Forest Service said that uh, any product that might be used on state or federal forest lands has to have a fire safe muffler. So they do a surface test as well as there is a, a spark arresting screen that traps any carbon uh, sparks that may have exited the engine. Other regulations in 1996, we had to reduce the, the noise level of all products. So we can't sell anything that's over 108 decibels in the United States. And then thirdly, in uh, also 96, uh, emissions laws uh, kicked in. So we had to do things to uh, not allow unburnt fuel to leave this engine. That is the biggest issue with two cycles. And so what I can tell you from uh, 1996 to today, uh, there is approximately 70% uh, emissions, 70% uh, less emissions uh, leaving these engines. So they're very clean 
and uh, meet all the government regulations for uh, emissions. First thing in the morning, you're fresh and, and uh, ready to go. It's pretty easy to start this equipment, but later in the day as you get tired, fatigued, um, it, they can become fairly hard to pull that rope over and, and start them. So we have two mechanisms to help you out, actually three, uh, but the first two are the starter rope. Uh, that starter rope that you see on the left hand of the picture, it has a, a stretchy factor to it, uh, as it says, a, a shock absorber. And the three benefits are um, it reduces the strength you need to start this engine or to rotate the engine by about 10%. Because it springs, it helps turn that flywheel faster. And then thirdly, um, it's always a good idea to grab the, the handle lift up about a, a three quarters of an inch to an inch until you feel the starter engage into the flywheel underneath it. Then I will have some pictures later to show you that. And then pull the rope. If you just grab the rope and, and pull, those plastic poles are slamming into a metal flywheel. You're gonna get wear and damage there. So three benefits to that. And then the one on the right is what we call easy to start. And when you pull the rope, you're winding up a large spring inside that starter assembly. And when that spring is tight enough to overcome the compression of the engine, that's what's starting it. So literally uh, just imagine pulling it very, very slowly. That's all the strength and, and effort it takes to start these uh, easy to start products. And then our larger uh, professional products, we have what we call a decompression valve. And as you can see in the upper right there, uh, when you push that button in, it literally puts a hole in the cylinder, so there's less force needed to start the, the engine. So between the Elasto start, uh, starter, which comes on all uh, pro professional products, and the decompression valve, um, it takes about 20% le less effort uh, to, to start this piece of equipment. Earlier, I mentioned the uh, using the choke when the engine is uh, sat there for, for a while. Uh, we used to say it's cold, but it really has nothing to do whether the engine's hot or cold, is whether it's sat there long enough for that fuel to evaporate. And so this bulb you see on all of our trimmers, uh, all of our blowers, and some of our lower uh, uh, sized consumer chainsaws, you push this primer until it's full of fuel, uh, typically takes five to six, uh, depressions of that primer. And what you've just done is you've filled the carburetor full of fuel so that instead of that oh, five to four to five pulls to, to prime it and get fuel and get it started, um, now it may only take one or two pulls. So again, anything that we can do to make it easier to start. I mentioned vibration earlier. And uh, Back before steel invented the, the vibration mounts, I would say in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, professional chainsaw operators used to get a disease called white finger. Uh, the vibration from the engine would literally kill the nerves in their hands and their hands would turn white. Uh, so between the rubber mounts that you see kind of in the center there, or uh, now we're going to the spring mounts that you can see in the lower left-hand corner, uh, those isolate your hands from the vibration of the engine. And with the rubber mounts, uh, those will wear out eventually, uh, typically because people, as they're using the chainsaw, the log or limb changes position. It, it pinches the bar and chain, stops them from, from uh, turning. And the customer has a tendency to, to pull and jerk on the saw to remove it from that, that blockage. Well, that wears out the mounts. And what we would say is a lot better uh, especially with logger, uh, larger logs, to have some plastic wedges. And as soon as you get that chain deep enough into the wood to uh, start a wedge in it, even just to put the tip of the wedge in it, you can keep that groove or what we call the kerf, uh, K-E-R-F, the kerf. We can keep that wide enough that it <clears throat> really can't uh, pinch the bar and chain at that point. Uh, there are times when I would, uh, they typically retail for about $12. There have been times I would pay $150 for a plastic wedge. So get one, uh, but back to the rubber mounts. If one fails, typically uh, you're going to replace all three of them or four, whichever it has. Now going more into safety features, uh, that arrow is pointed at the chain brake. 
It's activated in two manners. Uh, one is something contacts the tip of the bar, that saw uh, comes up and towards the operator. Your hand, your wrist hits that uh, lever. It moves forward, stops the clutch, and uh, that chain is not turning anymore. But it's also inertia activated. So visualizing your mind, you're falling a tree or you have a, uh, the saw in a position where your left hand is over on the side of the chainsaw, it's on its side. If you had a kickback that's severe enough, uh, it's inertia activated, it will automatically set that chain break. So that's what it looks like. You can see uh, that round, that large round diameter piece, that's called the clutch drum. Underneath that is uh, a mechanism with springs and these clutch shoes. And as the RPM increases, those shoes spread out, grab the clutch drum. And part of that clutch drum is the sprocket that turns the cutting chain. And then you can see the metal band and spring. So what happens there is when you have that kickback, uh, that lever activates, grabs the clutch drum with that band and stops the rotation of the chain. The one thing I really want to highlight here is we do see damage to this. People forget that the chain brake is on. So I would tell you anytime the chainsaw starts and is running, but the chain doesn't turn, we will, uh, you would want to immediately uh, drop it to an idle, pull back on that lever and verify that it is disengaged. Excuse me, there I take a drink. Um, we would also recommend that you always start the chainsaw with the chain brake engaged. That way, uh, as I said, at half throttle, uh, that chain is gonna be moving about 30 miles an hour. Uh, the saw is about half its total RPM. So imagine driving your car with an emergency brake on. That's what happens when this chain brake is engaged and you try to accelerate the chainsaw. It starts rubbing in there, creates a lot of heat and we do see very severely damaged chainsaws. So again, I just wanna emphasize two things. If the engine is running but the chain won't turn, pull that lever back towards the handle, uh, back towards you, verify that. If it still won't turn, I would take the, turn the saw off, take the bar on chain off and verify you know, what's, what's binding it. And then finally, during the starting process, as soon as that saw starts at half throttle, blip the, Flip the trigger to drop it down and idle, and therefore you won't do any damage. If you let it run even for 30, 40 seconds with the chain brake engaged and the chain trying to turn, uh, you will damage uh, components. I mentioned that kickback, and you notice there's a red circle there. That is the most dangerous part of the bar, uh, guide bar. That's called the kickback zone. And imagine as the chain rotates around the tip, it is very aggressive, it's very exposed. And what happens is the chain uh, sticks in the wood. And at that point, the bar is rotating on the chain and that's what throws it back and towards the operator. So as you are working with the wood, you always wanna make sure what is the location of that tip and do whatever you can not to use that area shown in the two top pictures. And even in the lower one, um, it may not, contact the operator, but it's still hitting the inside of the wood. It's not working properly and, and it's, it can't push that saw literally back towards the operator. So again, we're always gonna walk around any material we're cutting, logs, limbs, uh, make sure when we're bucking a log, there's nothing that we might hit with the tip of the bar. If there is, we wanna go around to that side of it and uh, address that first before we finish bucking. The rule we had with the Forest Service is there cannot be anything within 12 inches of the log that we're bucking. So if you look at that picture in the middle there, uh, that log, that other secondary log near the tip of the bar is definitely within that 12 inches. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna clean that out before I do that. And so three different types of kickbacks. Uh, the first is traditional. Uh, that's really about those pictures I just showed in the, the previous slide. Contact something at the tip of the bar the chain digs into the wood, it throws it back and towards you. Uh, this may be kind of hard to explain, but uh, pushback is you've sized up that log. And in your mind, that log is suspended on both ends by, you know, sitting across a canyon, something like that. 
uh, over a couple of logs. So typically what you would do, you, you would start your cut from the bottom of the log because again, because it's suspended on each end, it's gonna have a tendency to fall downwards as you cut through it. Well, once in a while, it's hard to judge that. And guess what, that, that saw actually moves upward as you're bucking, that grabs the saw and it pushes the saw right back towards the operator. One of the really important reasons why we always wanna keep that saw to the right of our bodies so that our body is never in the plane of the chainsaw in case that happens. Uh, the other one is, uh, you probably experienced this, anybody that's used a chainsaw for many hours at all. Again, you've sized up that log. In your estimation, the end of the log is hanging out in the air, it's suspended. So naturally the thought is that as you cut down, that end would fall down towards the ground and open up that kerf that I was talking about. But every once in a while, it does, again, you misjudged it, it comes uh, back up, it pinches the chain, and pulls you and the saw right into the log, uh, sometimes very violently when it does that. And back to imagine if there was another log or a stump up there on the other side, and now the tip of the bar is hitting that, uh, basically you're way out of control. Um, I'll use this situation to talk about blowdown. Uh, we're getting to that season where trees are gonna start coming down with windstorms and stuff. Uh, boy, I'd probably use a tractor or something and, and pull it free if it's all tangled up in a bunch of trees or hire somebody. Um, even professional loggers that do this for a living, if they walk into a, a patch of, of blowdown, uh, you know, it's like pickup sticks, they will usually walk away and come up with a different uh, way to do that. Just be really careful with blowdown. There's, there can be three or four different tensions sometimes in that, that single piece of wood. <clears throat> Well, unless you work for a government agency, and take a drink here. Um, unless you work for a government agency, you're probably private individuals, but OSHA requires that as a chainsaw operator, I need to wear a hard hat, hearing protection, eye protection, cut resistant leg protection, cut resistant boots. And here's why. Um, on average, uh, 42,000 people every single year uh, go to a hospital because they've cut themselves with a chainsaw. And as you can see there, the upper body, head and face, uh, left hand are the most likely area and legs to get hit with a chainsaw. And what I can tell you is the average cost of a visit to a hospital with a chainsaw is, injury is about $1,500. You can buy all of our safety apparel for less than 200. So it's really very cheap insurance. And you don't wanna cut yourself with a chainsaw. Uh, regrettably, my son cut his foot with one. Uh, they scrubbed on his foot with brushes and flushed it for about a half an hour, and he still almost lost his foot. Uh, you've got metal debris, wood chips, uh, dirt, oil, grease, you name it. It's a really nasty wound. So we don't want to, want to do everything in our power not to ever let our body contact the chain. So butt protection, uh, we had a rule in the Forest Service, we didn't even get out of our pickups unless we had a hard, hard hat on. Uh, there's those situations, uh, you may have heard the term widow maker. Uh, last winter, there's a windstorm, there's a branch sitting up above you, you don't realize it, you walk under it and it's your unlucky day and it falls and hits you. So really, when you're in the woods, you need to wear a hard hat of some variety. Uh, ultraviolet light does deteriorate polymer. So as it says there, uh, about every three to five years, you should replace it. Kind of rule of thumb, if it's not the bright orange, blue, whatever color that you purchased it, if it's getting faded, that means it is deteriorating and it will not give you the, the level of protection that you need. Uh, date them and that way you know it. Uh, we honestly, we don't sell uh, every five, three to five years, we replace our helmet systems. We delete the uh, components for them because they're not safe to use and, and we want you to replace them. What I mean by the liner there is that uh, the suspension system under the hard hat, you wanna keep that in good shape as well. If there's tears, breaks, uh, damage to the threads, uh, you can replace those in the helmet system for uh, pretty inexpensively. Uh, just for example, this whole system you see there is about uh, $50 for that. So you've got your hearing protection, uh, your face protection, meaning limbs and leaves and chips and stuff like that uh, protects your face. 
But as you can see, we still recommend safety glasses underneath that for high velocity uh, impact. When you talk about hearing protection, that is our most common occupational in injury. Uh, it's not repairable. Sure, we can get uh, hearing aids, but we really haven't fixed anything. And the danger zone there is about 85 to 100 decibels. And the reason that's dangerous is it's not physically painful. Uh, you don't realize you're hearing your, or damaging your hearing. So every hearing protection will have a NRR rating on the package, noise reduction rating. And so what you wanna do is the math, uh, the, the loudest thing we can sell in the US is 108 decibels, get a hearing protection that will get you below that 80 decibels. Foam earplugs are definitely the most effective, but for some people they're very uncomfortable. So you want something that you'll wear, uh, is comfortable. Uh, you may have it on for hours a day. And I know my uh, Forest Service buddies, they actually go to the doctor and uh, they make custom uh, earplugs because they may have them in their ears 12, 14 hours a day. But I'm living proof that they work. Uh, my first manager would almost hit me if I wasn't wearing them. I'm uh, 62 now and my uh, hearing is perfect in all ranges because if it's noisy, I'm wearing hearing protection and so should you. There are a few different styles of SHAP material out there. Uh, the original by the Forest Service was Kevlar. It was chain proof, but it really didn't tangle things up. Uh, we designed this a verdict ballistic nylon. Its sole purpose in life uh, is to stop chains or to slow them down. Uh, you can see there in that picture what happens. Uh, there are nine, uh, six to nine layers of ballistic nylon uh, woven underneath that orange uh, canvas coating that you see or whatever that color is. And when you hit the, the shafts with the chain, it pulls those fibers into the chain, into the sprocket, as you can see in this picture, into the bar tip, which also has uh, bearings in a sprocket. And it just plugs things up so it's very difficult uh, for that chain to, to turn. We have shirts that have that same material in the upper body and shoulders, as you saw from that picture of where injuries happen. That's a fairly common place. Uh, maintenance wise, when you buy a new set of shafts, they've been in a warehouse, they've had maybe 10, 15 other pair sitting on top of them. So that, that fabric has been compressed. First thing I'm gonna do is throw them in the wash machine and wash them, dry them, get the fluff back into them. And really anytime they get dirty, just throw them in the wash machine uh, like you would your clothing and uh, they get that loft back into it, it maintains them. Um, the Kevlar, that's the one issue with Kevlar is the more you wash them, it'll deteriorate over time. And so, uh, yeah, Inktex is the best way to go. But the final thing I always talk about when it comes to cut resistant clothing is it's not a suit of armor. If I take even our middle sized chainsaw, rev it up, and stick it into a pair of shafts, it will cut through. The hope is though, that gives you the reaction time to get it away from your body. And so it, it definitely is gonna reduce the severity of the injury. Uh, you may get cut, but it's not gonna be severe as if you were just wearing Levi's. Different types of shafts, there's aprons that most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, they look like cowboy shafts, but more and more people are going to uh, what we call cutting pants. They're just a pair of pants you put on in the morning that way you don't have to worry about taking shaps off and on. And they do give a little bit better coverage and less uh, chance that when the chain hits the shaps, it could pull them away from your body, uh, which is a point you want the shaps as tight as you can get them and still be able to move comfortably. That way it's less likely it could move it out of the way and expose the Levi's underneath. When it comes to safety glasses, uh, the only thing you should be concerned of is that somewhere on the frame, it says Z87. That is the newest rating for uh, safety glasses. And uh, that will, again, protect your eyes. Uh, we've noticed though, if they look cool, people will wear them. So that's why we're introducing ones that look more designer. And then finally, boots. Um, they need to be cut resistant. So the current uh, law is that uh, as long as they're a thick leather, logger style boot with eight, eight inch tops, they are acceptable for uh, chainsaw use. Now on the market, there are several varieties of uh, cut resistant boots. They'll have a layer of Kevlar or 
ink text between the le uh, leather and the inner lining um, work very well. And then if you are using rubber boots in the winter time, then the option is they have to have a protective layer if they're rubber boots. And again, still sells them and so do other companies. And the last thing I'll talk about is gloves. And really it doesn't matter what style of gloves, uh, leather, rubber, uh, I'll tell you my favorite right now are the little Atlas gloves uh, because they just fit my hands really tightly. And, and therefore I feel like I have a better grip on the piece of equipment. Uh, we have mittens that have protective uh, material on the left hand, as you may remember from that chart, the left hand was a very common spot for people to uh, cut themselves. And why is that? Uh, foolish people like me that put their thumb over the top of the handlebar instead of underneath it, like you see the uh, gentleman there at the top picture, or they throw their hand up to protect their face as the saw is running towards them. So we want to keep a good grip at all times. How do we start a chainsaw? Um, on the ground is the best way. The chain break is engaged, depending on whether it has been uh, run in the last five or 10 minutes, really uh, tells you where you want that master control, that on off switch that I showed you a little earlier. Again, just to reinforce, if it hasn't been run for a few days or a few hours, we're gonna put it in the choke position. If you just turn it off for a couple minutes, we're gonna go clear down to choke, one click up to that half throttle. And I guess why I'm saying that is um, everything that I'm telling you is in your operator's manuals. Normally at this time, I ask everybody to raise their hands and ask how many people have ever read their operator's manuals and maybe one to 2% of the people have. Uh, please do that. It shows you a ton of stuff. Everything I'm talking about is in that manual. So on the ground is the safest way, but uh, if you're getting up in age like I am 62, um, it's not really comfortable to get down on the down like that. So as you can see the gentleman in the middle, uh, you can hold it, uh, you sit on your left leg, basically wrap your right leg around the handle. And that's a very comfortable upright way to start that, that engine. Again, as soon as it starts, I'm gonna blip the throttle, just hit it real quickly so it goes down to idle. At that point, I'd let that saw warm up for, oh, 30 to 40 seconds. And I'll get to the next slide here. Uh, 30 to 40 seconds, and then I would just, rather than going to full RPM, just blip, 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 kind of like revving a car in and out um, for another 30 to 40 seconds to make sure that chainsaw is really warmed up, um, especially on a cold day. Uh, the piston expands much quicker than the cylinder, and you can get what we have a, as a, a hot seizure or cold seizure, excuse me. And finally, uh, as it says at the bottom, Never just hold the chainsaw at full RPM without cutting wood. Uh, imagine going out to your car, putting it in neutral and just holding the gas pedal down. Uh, it's not good for them. You only wanna use enough gas to cut the material that you're, you're cutting. Uh, keep it under a load. Uh, just to give you an example, when you're cutting a, a 20 inch log with a 20 inch bar, that chainsaw is probably turning about 9,000 RPMs with a good sharp chain. When you hold it and just hold the throttle wide open, now you're around 14,000 RPMs. Uh, everything's moving very quickly and you will damage that engine. And then finally, uh, if you're not sure if, if you're getting a sufficient amount of oil, uh, that's another reason to warm it up for a minute, minute and a half, is you do need to prime the oil system uh, to get the oil up in the oil pump, get it to the bar. And as it shows here, a piece of wood, a piece of cardboard, uh, something you just hold the saw a couple inches above it, rev it up a few times, and you'll see a nice uh, line of oil letting you know you do have the proper, uh, the oil is getting to the bar and chain. So at this point, I'll just kind of summarize the, the safety part of it. And then I, you know, if you think so, uh, Rebecca, we can stop if there's any questions and answer some questions on the, the safety side before we go into maintenance. So uh, thinking great. safety is being prepared. Um, for most of you, you don't use a chainsaw for a living. So I would get a kit together. Here's my chainsaw. Here's a duffel bag that has my extra chains in it, uh, my files, my bar wrench, uh, my safety apparel, so that I know when I grab that chainsaw, everything I need to operate it is in that duffel bag, your ax, because there's nothing like getting 30, 40 miles up into the woods and, oh man, I forgot my bar wrench and I need a new chain. 
Uh, it's really going to ruin your day. As you walk up to that uh, wood, whether you're cutting firewood, tree, whatever it is, um, take a minute to walk around. Uh, are there limbs and, and other trees maybe trapped underneath that log? Um, I'm really paying attention to what's above me. Uh, I may buck that log, it shakes another tree, which shakes a limb or a dead top out of that other tree. Um, so just really pay attention, look around, make sure you have good footing, uh, things like that. And most importantly, is I'm gonna take the time to make an escape route. If I need to get out of there quickly, I don't wanna trip on limbs, stumps, <laughs> roots, anything like that. I have a distinct uh, area there. In a uh, you know dangerous situation, I guess, uh, where you're really nervous, my best advice is to walk away, uh, maybe hire a professional, uh, maybe talk to somebody that has more experience, but uh, you really have to have somebody there that can watch for you. Uh, at the Forest Service, we call them swampers, and they would have a six foot long stick. They were looking up into the trees, uh, looking around, and we just knew if they jabbed you with that stick, follow him out. Don't look around, don't look what's happening, just get out of there. Uh, so knowing when to walk away. Um, and that's really important. Uh, a lot of people feel that, uh, you know, they've watched videos on falling trees. Uh, you really need to go to those videos that show uh, mistakes when people fall trees. Without a lot of experience, you should just hire somebody to do that. Um, it's very dangerous. There's a lot of things that can happen. And one of the worst things you can do is say, you know, that's just a little tree. Uh, that can't be dangerous. It's too low. Well, actually, I would tell you, small trees are more dangerous than large trees. Uh, big trees, once they start going, they're going to go to the ground. They have enough weight to get to the ground. Uh, small trees can hang up into other trees. They can bounce back at you. So I would, unless you have a lot of training experience, when it comes to falling trees, I would hire somebody to do that. Uh, be aware of fatigue. As I said, you're not feeling good. Hey, let's touch up the chain. Uh, let's take a little break. If you're not feeling good, don't use the equipment that day. Uh, there's really no machismo when it comes to running uh, power equipment, especially chainsaws. Don't use damaged equipment. And finally, maintain your tools, which is what we're going to talk about next. So Rebecca, if there's any questions I need to answer, if, if this is a good time, I can do that. Um, sure. Let's see. We have one question so far um, from Ryan, and I think this was in relation to some of the earlier slides. Uh, Ryan asked, do you find the issue of fatigue is decreased with electric or battery chainsaws? The, what, what, what decreases? <laughs> oh, the um, fatigue? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, as I've told everybody, I've been a chainsaw guy for 40 some years. Everything I own now is battery. Um, it's easy, meaning I don't have to worry about whether it's going to start, whether I remember to buy gas. You don't have that noise. You have less vibration. It is incredibly less fatiguing. The other thing that I like about battery chainsaws in particular is we don't have anything of much size. And so it kind of limits what people will attempt to cut uh, just because the maximum bar right now is about 18 inches. So people are probably not gonna try to cut a 40 inch tree with that little bitty battery saw. So there is a safety factor there as well. Great, thank you. Um, that is the only question I'm seeing right now. Um, so okay. yeah, feel free to keep going. And folks, if you have any other questions about safety or otherwise, drop them in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. Yeah, I see we have uh, just over 15 minutes, so uh, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll get at it. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, maintenance, preventive maintenance, uh, reduces the risk of accidents, uh, minimizes operating costs. And really, when I'm talking to professional about downtime, I've got 10 people standing around and everybody's can't do any work because the chainsaw is broken. That's more expensive. And then we're going to talk about uh, air filter, fuel system, engine cooling, and cutting systems. So let's start with the air filter because that's probably the, the most uh, abused part of our engines. Um, as you're using it, uh, fine dust and things collect on the air filter. Uh, what I talk about here is early products. These would be from 15 to 20 years ago. Um, I would probably have an extra filter and about halfway through the day, meaning I'm cutting you know, three or four cords of wood. I'm, I'm using it for four or five hours. Maybe halfway through that, I would go ahead and, and clean the air filter or replace it with a new one. 
in the field, uh, you can just tap it on, on the saw, uh, take a small toothbrush, a, a paintbrush, soft bristle, and just kind of wipe the material off of it. And then when you get back home, the best way to clean them is with uh, a detergent type, uh, a, a grease dissolving like Dawn dishwashing detergent, uh, soak it in there, uh, back flush it after five or 10 minutes, let it dry overnight, it's ready to go. But as I said earlier, um, the most abused product that we have, our component is probably the air filter. So we have what's called a telecarb now that really adjusts the carburetor based on how plugged up that air filter is. And what I mean by that is, as the air filter becomes plugged, I get less air, but there's nothing to restrict the fuel so that engine doesn't run at peak performance. This new telecarb system will automatically adjust it. And the big difference here for everybody is do not clean the air filter until you notice a lack of power. And what I mean by that is you're cutting with the saw, boy, it's just, just dropping through the wood like butter. And suddenly, boy, I've, I've got to lift up on the saw. I can't push quite as hard. That's the sign that air filter is plugged up enough that I don't have enough air or fuel to create power. And that's when I clean the filter. And that could be days, weeks, months, depending on how you use it. But we did that for two reasons. Uh, one is so you didn't have to clean it as often. And secondly, um, the dirtier that filter is, the better job it does of keeping fine uh, abrasive material out of that, that air filter and out of the engine. As we found out with Mount St. Helens, um, if it doesn't keep the, the small stuff out, it'll just chew up that engine really quickly. The example there is, uh, again, we'd use soapy water to clean this. The example of that filter is one that somebody has used uh, compressed air to blow out the filter. That's really the worst thing you can do because all it does is blow holes in it and let that abrasive dust in. Uh, another old technique was to pour gasoline onto it. Uh, modern air filters, the gasoline will, will damage the filter. But just as importantly, the gasoline evaporates but the mix oil is still there. So now you have an oil filter that's gonna dirty even quicker. And here's an example of what happens if you run it long enough with that dirty air filter, uh, these engines will find a way to get air. And as you can see in that middle picture, you can see that puddle of dirt. That's dirt that's been going by the filter and into the engine, it's gonna damage it. That other filter shows where somebody has been using air to blow it out, replace them. Uh, good idea, we remove the filter, uh, hold it up to some light, and you should be able to see through it. My favorite subject is um, most of you, when you buy the new chainsaw, you got that orange uh, screwdriver. You can see an H and L screw. The L screw is what we call the low speed for uh, idle and acceleration. The high speed regulates the maximum RPM. Well, when you buy that product, blower, trimmer, chainsaw, the dealer will set that for your elevation, your environment. And what I can tell you is for the rest of the life of that product, those screws are never going to change position. But it's very common for people, hey, it's not running right. Uh, it doesn't start as easily. Let me get in there and adjust that carburetor. Uh, what I can tell you is that's absolutely the worst thing you can do. Uh, do some of the maintenance things that I'm going to show you here in a minute. If it still doesn't run properly, get it to a skilled mechanic and a, a skilled mechanic and have them fix it. I can't tell you the number of examples of uh, again, typically pro operators. They come in, the saws badly damaged, the engines damaged. I say, hey, did it run right? No, no, but I adjust the carburetor and got me through the day. And all they needed was a five or six dollar fuel filter, but instead they hid that problem with their carburetor, which created a much more expensive repair. This area of the, the chainsaw is called the starter assembly, but you notice all the slots. The way I would think of this is, is just like the radiator on your car. If that is packed with sawdust, leaves, um, one of the reasons we suggest you always have your shirt uh, tucked in is so it's not sucking into those uh, cooling fins. And when it happens, it's just like driving your car in the summertime with a piece of cardboard or something over your radiator, it's gonna overheat. So we wanna keep those clean. You can see there the flywheel grabs that air and pushes it against the fins that you see in this picture. And that's really, these are air-cooled engines. 
So the air from that flywheel going across those fins is what keeps this engine cool. In this example, you can see that's coated in uh, pitch, uh, sawdust. You could should be able to see light uh, at the front and the back of those fins. So it's completely plugged up. Uh, this was a brand new saw that had a severe engine damage within three weeks just because of overheating. Going on to the starter assembly, uh, you can see there uh, a good idea. And this is always good, especially if you're going some distance for your from your house, is I would start it before you leave your, your house. Uh, again, there's nothing like driving 20, 30 miles to the mountains and it doesn't start. And there you go, you've wasted a lot of gas and time and energy. So I'd start it there. Um, pull the rope out occasionally or, you know, before you start it, make look for any fraying, any damage to the rope. You see these black poles that are nestled there in the center. So at the very tips of those, they'll start getting wore off. Uh, that's one thing we look at. And by the way, there's only four screws needed to access this. And now you can see how they're popped out towards the edges. And that's what I mentioned before. So you pull that rope about a half an inch, those poles jump out, they grab uh, these notches in the flywheel and that's what rotates the saw to start it. So imagine if you just grab the rope and jerk on it, what happens is those plastic poles drive themselves into those metal nubs, it's gonna wear out versus pull it just a little bit, it's engaged, it's ready to go. Uh, it will last a long, long time. We wanna talk about fuel and, and how to address fuel. And uh, I would tell you ethanol is in most of the fuel that we buy in the market today. There isn't a, a lot of problems with, with ethanol if it's used up quickly. The real issues are um, it has more vapor uh, in it than, than non-ethanol fuel. So that fuel uh, can evaporate and spoil quicker than a standard fuel. Uh, most importantly though, ethanol has a real affinity to, to water meaning that if you have a gas can without a cap on it or you leave the cap off your your trimmer or your chainsaw and if there's moisture in the air that gasoline will literally absorb water uh, it's hard to see in this picture on the right but you can see that lighter shade there in that bucket um, that is water so every once in a while uh, we may want to drain the fuel completely out of it and dry that water out of it and then of course dispose of that fuel in a uh, environmentally friendly uh, manner. And then all of our equipment has a fuel filter. And as you can see there, we have a special tool that's a little hook that you can reach down and hook that uh, fuel line up out of the fuel tank. Uh, a clothes hanger works great. Just make sure you dull uh, the end of it so it doesn't uh, jab a hole in the fuel line. But you can just pull it right out of the tank and then that fuel filter pops right off the end of the fuel line. I would assume that the, the engine probably had had gas in it before you, you did this job, you poured the gas out of it. You unplug it, set it on, the, on your bench, and basically all the fuel should flow back out of that filter telling you, yeah, I'm able to pull fuel through that. But if it's discolored at all, um, if you see fuel still left inside the fuel filter after it sat for a couple minutes, that's a sign that's not flowing enough gasoline into the engine. And it's what we call, it, it's lean at that point. Uh, there's more air than there is gasoline. Of course, the gasoline has your lubrication in it, uh, plus the gasoline just splashing on the engine is a coolant. So if we reduce the fuel flow, we've increased the RPM of the engine, more friction, while at the same time, we've eliminated our cooling system. And those retail for five or six dollars. Uh, actually, right now we have what's called a tune-up kit that comes with a new air filter spark plug, which we're gonna talk about next, and a fuel filter. And in many cases, that kit is less than buying just an air filter. So that's really a way to go. What I wanna show you here is, you can tell how that engine is running just by looking at the spark plug. The upper left-hand corner, it, that's the normal, should be kind of a light to chocolate brown color versus uh, carbon and blackness. Maintenance, we want to have uh, really the best thing you can do for your chainsaw is have extra chains and rotate, rotate them. One gets dull, you flip the bar over, clean the bar, flip it over, put a new chain on. 
the chain will last longer, the bar will last longer, and the sprocket itself will last longer. Uh, in your operator's manual, it tells you how to lubricate that bearing. And depending on use, um, you know, really uh, how often you do that, you can also look at clutch shoes and other uh, items. And that picture is just a chain that's been damaged by a wore out sprocket. The sprocket on the right is worn. You can see how it's, uh, the metal isn't flat anymore. And that means that gear is no longer the right diameter. It's gonna damage the chain. And you can see some uh, problems here with bar tips. Uh, gentleman is, or the person is rotating the bar, but it's too loose. That's why it's making those uh, damaged by the tip. Um, you can see a very, very worn sprocket there. But bottom line, uh, this tooth has more than half its life left. You're not gonna do any more damage. I would use the sprocket, use the chain. And then when you change the chain, you change the sprocket. Just always remember they're a match set. When I change one, I really wanna change the other, which is the benefit of having two to three chains. I can wear out three chains before I have to, again, replace that sprocket and freshen up my chains. So a little bit about maintenance, um, inspect the air filter. This is after every day you use it. Look at the uh, uh, cutting system, make sure it's sharp, clean the bar, rotate it, all good ideas. Um, inspect the fasteners, just go around with that a little T27 and make sure all the screws. And then cleaning, simple green, a brush, anything like that that you can just kind of wipe it off and clean it off. And then if I'm using it really heavy, um, Maybe once a week, I'll do a little bit more depth where I will look at the fuel filter, sprocket, maybe take the starter assembly off and clean things up underneath the, the flywheel and things like that. And that cleaning and constant uh, attention to the saw will make sure you're familiar with it. And so you're going to notice things. Hey, I don't remember that crack being there last time I did maintenance or this doesn't look right. And what I can tell everybody is maintenance is always less expensive than to repair. If you wait until it's broken, again, I'll thank you for that, but um, it becomes much more expensive. You become much more frustrated with the product. So maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. As I said, in eight years, uh, we had very few failures because they had maintenance every single day. So going on here with fuel, um, we have spent millions of dollars over the years developing a fuel that, uh, a mixed oil that works best in our products. I can tell you that Husqvarna makes good oil, Echo makes good oil, Shindawa, as long as they're making a high performance uh, oil for a high performance engine, it'll be okay. Now, three or four years down the road, I'll definitely be able to see differences in wear characteristics because of oil. So why not use steel? It's at the same price. Uh, you're not saving anything by going with a cheaper oil. Uh, use a minimum 89 octane. That's to produce uh, reduce uh, detonation pre-ignition. And there is no tanks under the ground that have 89 octane in it. It is a blend of the high octane and the low octane, 60-40% uh, uh, blend. Therefore, you're getting all the goodies that that expensive gas has in it. Uh, mix it at 40 to one. That's why we make uh, bottles uh, one size for one gallon, two gallons, two and a half, five gallons. Uh, mix it properly and make sure that can, uh, that gas can has enough volume in it to get the proper amount of fuel. So you're you know, you're down to a cup or two of gasoline, you pour in a, a one gallon mix, but you can only get three quarters of a gallon of gasoline. You're not at 50 to one. So make sure you have enough room to give the full quantity of fuel. Uh, talked about ethanol. Again, uh, we adjust around that, absorbs water. And we don't have to worry about solvent because it's been in the system long enough that all your gas cans and fuel tanks are clean now. But really, if any of you have any of those old 041s and 031s, those vintage classic steel chainsaws, we don't make fuel line components that will withstand ethanol. It'll just uh, dissolve them basically. So set them on a shelf, say what a great saw it was and uh, go on to something modern that can, can do better. Uh, fuel is an organic product. It's hard to think of that, but it was uh, from dinosaur bones and, and flesh and leaves and all that stuff. So as soon as it's exposed to oxygen, it deteriorates, it rots just like a, a anything else does. Uh, another way I think about it, open up a can of pop and let it sit in the sun for a couple hours, it goes flat. Same thing happens to, to gasoline. Those light molecules uh, that are volatile that actually burn evaporate out of the fuel. And yeah, it looks like gasoline, but it, it's really hard to catch it on fire. 
And then fuel stabilizer is the last thing I'll, I'll warn you about. Uh, some of you may have used it over the years. It will keep your fuel from damaging the equipment for a year, but it doesn't maintain the octane. So unless you have it in a, a uh, airtight container, it is definitely going to spoil. Uh, so try to use, only mix enough to use on a regular basis. And that's why we developed Motomix. It's a uh, very pure gasoline that has a lifespan of uh, two to two and a half years. It has our best uh, synthetic uh, mix oil in it. It's uh, 95, 94 octane fuel, so very good fuel. But most importantly is that, uh, that lifetime of it. It is $8 a liter, so it's pretty, inexp pretty expensive to use every time you're using the product. But I would grab a can of it at the end of the year uh, when you think, yeah, maybe I'll use that chainsaw trimmer one more time. Use Motomix to fuel it. That way, if you forget, uh, next spring, you won't spend $150 to $130 to uh, uh, get your product fixed. So, Rebecca, I think I've hit my time limit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, and we're, we're a I little bit over. Keep... Um, yeah. But thank you so much. Yeah, we don't really have time for questions. But if Ooh, there okay. are any questions, I'll pull them aside and, and send them to you via email to then yeah. share back. Mm -hmm with the group. Um, but JD, thank you so much for all of this practical and useful information and for spending some time with us on your Saturday. You betcha. Happy to do it. And it's the best part of my job. And I'll just remind everybody, everything you need to know is in your operator's manual. If you've lost it, you can go to the Steel USA website, look for manuals. You can either print it yourself or they'll ship you an original version to your house for free. And thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right, bye now. Bye.